Thank you. Look, I've got some questions about the Ruddock Religious Freedom Review. Um, so, look, I just want to know what involvement the department has had in the operations of the review, in particular about sort of who they're hearing from and the hearing schedules for the review. So, Senator, the Secretariat for the review is housed within PMNC. It's led by Andrew Walter, and he'll be happy to answer your questions. Great. Sorry, Senator. Uh, so, what's basically, the, oh, sorry, the, the schedule of hearings and the interviews and the, the, who the Ruddock Review is talking to, how that's been determined. Uh, so, uh, sorry, Andrew Walter, Acting First Assistant Secretary, Religious Freedom Review. Um, so, the, um, the program of consultations has uh, been, I guess, you know, we, the, the Secretariat did some initial research and developed an initial plan for consultations, which was then ticked off by, at a fairly high level, I must say, by the expert panel itself. Um, that plan has developed as we've gone along um, and uh, also we've um, added additional elements to it as submissions have come in as we've identified uh, more groups that are interested in uh, meeting with the panel. Right. Can you outline for me sort of the, the range of consultations of how many meetings have been held with different groups? Mm, sure. Um, so, uh, we have had, uh, if we include today, so the panel has been meeting with um, stakeholder groups today. I think today was the 14th uh, day of uh, consultations. Um, I'll just double check that number. Um, but it's about, it's around that, that kind of number. Uh, and they've been, they've uh, so far been to, including today, uh, Brisbane, Sydney twice, Melbourne, Hobart, Perth. They'll be in Adelaide tomorrow. And uh, if you checked our website five minutes ago, we've now updated that we're going to Darwin as well. Right. And so how many groups and individuals have, have the panel met with? Yeah, sure. So um, it would be, it's well in excess of 50. It's, it's probably uh, getting close to the 100 mark if you count it individuals. Um, it's a wide range, um, you know, very large number. The full the full number will be included in the report. Happy to you know list some if you'd like that. If that would be look, an if you ta take it on on notice, and if that yeah, comes sure. out before the report, that would be that very would be happy valuable. to do that. Um, so, what was the process that was um, used to deem it appropriate for the panel to attend the event called Freedom of Religion or Belief, creating the constitutional space for other fundamental freedoms in Sydney? Uh, so that event that you're talking about was a conference, an academic conference, which was organised at the University of Notre Dame in uh, Sydney. Uh, the panel did not attend the conference per se. They attended a, uh, I guess, a round table or a symposium, if you like, uh, with some of the uh, people who were participating in that conference. Uh, that went for around about the 90 minute mark. Um, the uh, people who, so you, you had at that, that conference and, and, the, and it was a subset of the people who attended that conference, uh, many of the leading academics on religion and the law in Australia. So what was the process by, that, by which their attendance at that symposium was uh, So the, the fact that the conference was taking place was drawn to our attention. The panel had already indicated that it was keen to have an academic roundtable of some sort, where it met with a few academics to discuss varying views on religious freedom. That conference was occurring. Uh, we made contact with the organisers. They said they could facilitate a session with that, uh, with that, uh, with the, the people attending that conference, uh, and that's that's how we got there. There now. Just to complete the picture, um, not everyone the panel was interested in meeting with was going to that conference from an academic perspective. So there's been a range of additional meetings with um, academics. So to pick a good example, Carolyn Evans, Professor Carolyn Evans from the University of Melbourne, widely regarded as the foremost expert of relig on religion and the law in Australia. She attended the conference but wasn't available for the symposium. So caught up with her in Melbourne consultations. So, so to, to clarify, so it was so 
the department initiated the, the you were aware, made aware that the conference was happening and then you initiated and requested as to whether you could organise a, a session for the panel. We spoke to the organisers about whether there mm. was anything and, to And did all of the panel attend that symposium session? Uh, that's a good question. I'm, I think that Father Frank Brennan wasn't available on that day, um, but otherwise, uh, let me see. Yes, that's right. Uh, Father Frank Brennan wasn't able to attend, but the rest of the, the members of the panel did. And did some of the members of the panel attend other sessions of the conference as well as the symposium, to your knowledge? I don't think so, no. Okay. No, no they were all, we, we had other consultations on in Sydney on that day, and all the other panel members were, were at those. So was there any consideration given of attendance by the panel at other events um, organised by, say, the LGBTIQ community or broader human rights or anti-discrimination or secularist events deemed necessary in order to canvas all views? Uh, so when, uh, when the panel first met, so we, we, the panel met on the 10th of January, they asked the Secretariat to undertake a kind of survey of upcoming events, if you like, uh, that might be relevant to uh, the issue. Um, and uh, we identified a couple of possibilities. None of them, I'll, I'll be upfront, none of them were LGBTI events. Um, and uh, eventually the, the panel decided that the only one that, that was relevant to their question on religion and the law was this particular conference. Um, we didn't identify at that stage any other, other events, however, um, I should say in, in, that if there was an event that was relevant to the terms of reference and it was being organised by the LGBTI community, if that's drawn to the Secretariat's attention, we'd of course be very happy to put that to the panel. So it was the, the 10th of January that you, you, got, you looked at uh, events sorry, from... Sorry, because uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested. I mean, there was a, a very substantial gathering, the Better Together Conference, which was... About, about, the 12th, about that time, yes, that's it, right. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, so, which would have been very valuable for the panel to, to have yes. attended. Um, so I was aware of that conference largely because uh, we thought about sending somebody from the Secretariat to the conference. Uh, given how much other work was on for the Secretariat at that time, I wasn't able to release someone to do that. Um, the, the issue there, um, yes, that conference, from memory, 12th, 13th January, something mm. around then, uh, the panel met on the 10th of January, gave us our writing orders to develop a consultation plan, the first iteration of which was approved on the 2nd of February. So unfortunately, the timing for that one just, just didn't work. Um, in terms of the Notre Dame Symposium, do, does the panel consider that that was a neutral event or was it specifically uh, um, the, the views that were expressed by the people at that symposium expressing a particular side of the debate? Uh, I think that's something you'd have to ask the panel about what, what they heard and how they interpreted that. Um, I think that you could say that there were um, a range of voices, including uh, uh, you know, voices that, that advocate for a traditional uh, definition of marriage. Because certainly looking at the attendance list and the speakers list for the whole conference, it was very much um, biased in favour of people who are, you know, in favour of the traditional view of marriage, um, you know, basically full of anti-LGBTI um, equality um, academics, authors, activists. So, so the, the question, you know, given that the panel attended that, why hasn't there been an equivalent opportunity afforded to other, you know, anti-discrimination academics? Uh, well, uh, there's there's a couple of points I think that we can make there, that throughout the consultation process, the panel is meeting with a very large number of different groups and individuals uh, who take a variety of positions in relation to uh, religion and the law and religious freedom, including in relation to same-sex marriage, although of course the review is not confined to that issue. Um, the panel is being exposed to a whole range of different views. You won't be surprised that some of those views are quite conservative, uh, and then uh, you know some of those views are, are at the opposite end of the spectrum in relation to both religious freedom and in relation to same-sex marriage. So, the the panel is seeing a whole range of views. We've had a number of sessions with, well, in every city, in in all those cities that I've mentioned, we've had 
sessions with representatives from the LGBTIQ community as have well. You, is there? Do you have? Are you keeping a, a breakdown of the different types of organisations that you that the panel has been consulting with? We, I haven't done the, the numbers on it, but we are acutely aware of the importance of making sure that we are getting uh, a balanced range of views before the, the panel, uh, or, or that, that diversity of views before the panel. But are, are, are you um, doing a, a, a tallying, so to speak? We haven't actually done a tallying, but, but you know, I, I mean, when I look at the, uh, I mean, we could do it fairly easily, um, but when I look at that picture, um, you would say that, uh, yes, there, there, there's a whole diversity in there. It is, it is pretty reasonably balanced. Can we get a list of all the organisations that the panel has met with so far? I can give you that list, yes. Okay, so, um, that would be yep. appreciated. Thank you. Um, I'm interested as to whether you've got any insight as um, read, there was reports in the media that um, that Mr Ruddock told the roundtable gathering that last week that he was wanting to, he told those present that while he expected the group to represent, to present erudite opinions about what can be done to have the best possible human rights protection anywhere in the world, he similarly expected that if he went back to parliament with those recommendations, he would be told that it was not what they were looking for. Have you got any insight as to why he would have said that? Uh, I'm sorry, I, w I wasn't present. I'm not sure that that he did say that. I would I would have to confirm that. I, I think that uh, it was reported in the Catholic News Weekly. So. Sure. <laughs> um, I think that uh, the observation I could make, and it goes for Mr. Ruddick, it goes for all our panelists, is that they are very strongly evidence-based. They are looking for evidence that current arrangements don't work and need reform whatever direction that might be. And and so do you have any sense of what, you know, what were the what did he expect would be the best possible human rights protection that he expected that the parliament would reject? Uh, no, and I don't, I, I, I don't. No. Okay. Um, so in terms of the panel members and their attendance at all sessions. So you've already said that not all the panel members can attend all sessions. Yes. So how many, do you, have you got a breakdown of which panel members have been attending each session? Um, I can tell you up until, yes, I can tell you that for, if, do you want me to go through that? Yes, please. Uh, so uh, there were meetings in Canberra on the 5th and 6th of February where all panel members attended. Uh, meetings in Perth uh, on the 12th and 13th of February uh, were attended. Uh, maybe I can just say the chair has attended all, right. and so I'll just add the yes. additional ones. Yep. Uh, Professor Aroni and Dr. Bennett attended the Perth sessions. Uh, for the first, we've had two sessions, three days in Sydney. For the first two days, we had, um, in addition to Mr. Roddick, Professor Aroni, Dr. Bennett, and Professor Croucher. In Hobart, we had uh, Professor Aroni, Dr. Bennett, Father Brennan. In Melbourne, we had uh, Professor Roney, Dr. Bennett, and Father Brennan attended some, but not all of the sessions. Uh, and we had, uh, on Friday, we're in Sydney. We only had Mr. Ruddock and Professor Roney. Uh, and today, uh, in Brisbane, we had Professor Roney, Dr. Bennett, and Father Brennan. Uh, and the reason uh, why they're not at all sessions is uh, as simple as we've appointed a high uh, profile panel that have uh, very uh, strong commitments. So for example, uh, last week, uh, Professor Croucher uh, was in Geneva on uh, Human Rights Commission work, so wasn't available for those consultations. And, and what processes are being, um, are, is being used to bring the panel up to date with the sessions that they have sure. missed? Um, so, obviously, the panel has been travelling around quite a lot together in recent times. Uh, so we have been using those sort of opportunities to bring uh, panellists up to speed on what's occurred. However, the, the more <coughs> formal way in which we're going to do that is we'll have uh, what we're loosely calling a framing session, but a session at the end of the consultations to talk about all the different things that we've heard and make sure that everyone's uh, on the same page as to what they've heard. The other thing that's very important to note is that 
with a small number of exceptions, almost all those, the groups that we've met with have made submissions to the review and all the panel members get those submissions uh, just as, I mean, they get all the submissions, but, but they're packaged up. But surely they are, adding, they are adding things in their oral submissions because you, you're not doing any transcriptions. There's no, no Hansard equivalent or no, no recordings right. that are being made. That's right. So um, but yes, we are going through that sort of a, a, a less formal process of talking to the panel members about the things they've missed, but then there'll be that more formal wrap up where we'll make sure that everyone has that so, sense of, of uh, everything that's been heard. So, so what's your record keeping then? I mean, if, if there are things being added to in the oral submissions, if you haven't got um, a, a recording of it, what's your process? For, uh, so for uh, panel members are taking their own notes how, um, and each session is attended by at least two members of the Secretariat who also take notes. Right, and will those notes be made public? But will the formal, um, your summaries of what, what was presented be made public? Um, the, the, the approach that the panel has uh, taken with this, um, very similar to the approach taken by the Australian Law Reform Commission, for example, is to say, we ask you to put those things that you're happy to have in a report on the record in a submission that we can use. Um, and with your consent, and we can quote from it. Um, the, those uh, sessions uh, with, with uh, stakeholders allow the panel to test some of those ideas and, uh, and sometimes you know, put the, the counter view um, and have a discussion about what's been put in those submissions or other views they want to put. We've had a couple of sessions where new arguments, new ideas have been raised. Uh, the chair has been uh, very diligent about saying, can you please put that in a submission for us so we can use it? So you are confident that there aren't things that are being missed or you know, could be overlooked because they are not, they're, they're not in a written submission? You know, they're influencing the panel, but there's no, no evidence trail, so to speak. Um, we, as I, as I said, the, the things that the panel, that are new and that the, the panel is feeling like, oh, that, that's important information, it should be on the record, they've asked for submissions on that, additional submissions in some, some instances. So on how that, many so. additional submissions have they asked for? There's only been a small number, but, but of, the, of the ones that I've been in, the, the, and I haven't been in them, all of them, obviously I'm not there today, um, most of the topics that have been raised have not strayed very far at, at all from the, uh, the submissions those organisations have made. Okay. Now, it is the intention to publish the submissions, I understand? It is the intention to publish the submissions. There are some caveats on that. Obviously, we need consent, uh, and there will be some submissions that we wouldn't publish for legal or other reasons. And so what's the expected time when you will be publishing the submissions? Uh, so we have received uh, in excess of 16,000 submissions, um, which is obviously a very large number. Uh, the panel uh, uh, announced, uh, the, when, it, when the panel met for the first time on submission and discussed submissions on the 10th of January, it said that it wanted to publish them uh, by the 31st of March, which is the reporting date. Right. So, and you're still consider you will meet that deadline of publishing. So, basically, uh, publishing submissions only by the reporting date. That's so, right. There, there are a huge number of them. Right. And we're we're working through that. And so, so you are still committed to um, publishing them on that reporting date. Then. That's our intention. Okay. Thank you. Just a follow-up question, mm. there, Senator Rice. Um, I noticed in the media, sixteen and a half thousand submissions received. Is that an accurate figure? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the 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 figure. The, the actual number we've received is around about the 16,800 mark. Now, we ha while we have done everything we can to control for duplicates and for blanks using web form, there are still a, a few in there that we're pulling out as we go through. Sure. So that figure will come down a little bit, but it's around the 16,500. Sure, so presumably the 16,000 includes kind of form submissions where they've been automatically generated by a campaign website and they're That's essentially right. the same as each other. That's Do you right. know yet how many, I guess, there are for substantive individual submissions compared to those form ones? So um, we had a pretty good idea up until the last week when we hit a... a, a uh, the fact that we were getting over a thousand submissions a day in the, the last week. Um, so for the first 8,000 or so, um, 
you know, there were a couple of groupings of a couple of hundred at a time that were in that kind of campaign type uh, format. Um, don't really know for the full picture yet. We're, we're sure. literally still working through that huge volume. Sure. So, Senator Ross? Yes. And so, in terms of the Secretariat support in order to work through them all and to publish them, are you ne is, is there a greater amount of Secretariat support that you have needed to, to bring on board to deal with those numbers of submissions? Yes, we'll bring on extra people. Right. OK. In order to get, get them published by the end of March. OK. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Senator Ross. Yeah, Senator Smith.